morning. It's a great privilege, honor to be back here again. I love it. I love being invited back because it means that maybe the first time was okay. First couple times were okay. So kind of hear an affirmation in that. That's great. Um, let's, let's pray as we open up God's word. Father, you've said that your word is truth. And it also says that God's word is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. And so uh, I just ask that it would live today in these next moments, that your word would speak to us. And so I pray, Father, that you would do what I cannot do. I come to you as a broken person um, and yet one that you have given your word to. And so I just pray that, that, you, would, um, that you would speak. I know... Each one of us in this room is probably carrying things that maybe some of us don't, you know, would, would be afraid to share with the person sitting next to us, or, or maybe not. But whatever it is, you have, you know, you can see what's going on in our hearts. And so you know what needs to happen, and you, your heart just desires to speak a word, the right word to each one of us this morning. And so uh, through your spirit, I just pray that, that you'd have the freedom to do that. And, uh, and that our hearts would be open to hear what you have to hear, or have to say. Amen. All right, so uh, kind of show of hands this morning. Uh, thinking about the Psalms, how many of you find that throughout, throughout your life, the Psalms are a place that, that you go when you really need to hear a word from God, especially maybe an encouraging word or some comfort, something like that. Does any, is anybody like me? That's one of the maybe first places you go. I think that's true about a lot of us. In fact, when Jesus was hanging on the cross at, in his darkest moment, what did he do? He turned to the Psalms. He quoted from Psalm 22 when he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I always kind of wonder why, why did those words come to his mind rather than something more comforting, like, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, thou art with me, right? 
Um, I'm sure Jesus knew both pas passages well. He's God. <laughs> Um, he lived in close fellowship, trusted his father. But I think, I think in that moment of desolation and darkness for him in his humanity and, and as the son of his father, I think that psalm was where his heart went as a reflection of the cry that was there. He was in agony, right? Physical agony, emotional agony, spiritual agony, and his father seemed far away. And so he cried out, the words of the psalm, my God, my God, why have you given up on me? Where are you? And I find that the psalms do, do that for us, right? Sometimes they nail it, right? I, when I go there, they nail me right where I'm at. They say in words that I can't even, they say things that I can't even put into a coherent thought sometimes. And so I continue to go back there. So at times the psalms seem almost kind of bipolar, like flipping back from from, you know, destroy all my enemies and woe is, woe is me, you know, the world's against me, all the way to, you know, I trust you, God, I'm confident you are faithful, all of those things. And I think that's what our lives are like. Like, we find ourselves in both of those places. It's a reflection of what life is like for the most of us, ups and downs, joys and sorrows, fear and trust. And I think that's what draws us there to the Psalms. That's what draws me there because I identify at such a deep level. And so that's, that's where I want to bring you this morning is into one of those Psalms. And I want you to find something this morning. I want you to find maybe a, a word of help or a word of encouragement or maybe a word of courage for, for that thing that, that's in front of you right now. And I don't know what that thing is. Maybe there's nothing in front of you right now. But... Um, I, I imagine in a, a group of people this size, there are at least a few people who have something that is difficult in front of them right now. So I want you to find help for that or, or maybe help for that next thing that comes across your path. Um, most of you look pretty peaceful, happy, sitting out there. <laughs> but I imagine if some of us were to let that mask drop, um, Maybe we would even say we're facing an enemy that, that it doesn't seem we can find victory over. So David is one of the most prolific psalm writers, and he was acquainted with those kinds of enemies, the enemies that surround him, the enemies that seem to overwhelm him. And it's his story that I want to put on display today. And the psalm, and I want you to see the psalm that he wrote kind of on the, from the other side of his story that I think can speak into whatever battle it is, whatever difficult thing that you might be facing today. So, so if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Psalm chapter 3. That's where we're going to spend most of our time today. And I just want you to look at David's heart as he kind of lays it bare for us in Psalm 3. It's a short psalm. It begins this way. O oh Lord, how many are my foes. Many are rising up against me. Many are saying of my soul, there is no salvation for him in God. But you, O oh Lord, are a shield about me, my glory and the lifter of my head. I cried aloud to the Lord and he answered me from his holy hill. I lay down and slept. I woke again for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of many thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God. For you strike all my enemies on the cheek. You break the teeth of the wicked. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing be on your people. So I want to look first at kind of the setting for this psalm because it's going to help us understand uh, why David is saying some of these words. And, and I've added, in my own Bible, I've added a title to the top of this psalm. And my title for, for this psalm, the title for my message, is A Morning Prayer of Trust. I get that out of verse 3 where, uh, or I'm sorry, verse 5 where he says, you know, I laid down and I slept and then I woke up. And I, what I picture in my mind is David laying down sleeping, waking up in the morning, and writing down these words. Or maybe he spoke these words out to God and journaled them, you know, on a stone somewhere out there in the desert. Um, but this is David's morning prayer of, of, of trust. And his morning, I believe, starts, as we're going to see, I think it starts in this cloud of, of fear and failure 
and disappointment that, that just leads deeper into kind of the storm of danger. And so I identify with that because I don't like failure, especially failure that I bring upon myself, right? <laughs> it's one thing if someone else is causing you to, to mess up or to fail, but when I bring that on myself, my response is, is I'm less apt to run toward God. I'm more apt to step away from Him and try to hide because I'm in this kind of self-created mess and I, I somehow feel like I don't even deserve God's help. And David is writing these words in Psalm 3 in the middle of one of those self-created messes. The trouble he's in, in the setting of behind this psalm, is a direct result of his own actions, his own behavior. And he's reaping the consequences of those actions. He's the one to blame for where he's at. So if I look in my Bible, and I'm guessing most of your Bibles at the very top, before even verse 1, there's a heading for this psalm. And it says this, it's a psalm of David when he fled from Absalom, his son. So it's kind of the first psalm that gives us a historical context like that. You'll find that throughout a lot of the psalms. And if you ever see that little heading above a psalm, dig into the story behind that because it's going to give you a, a much fuller context for the psalm itself. But those words, a psalm of David when he fled from Absalom, his son, those words tell us the whole story. And so I want to, even before we look at the verses, I want to look at the story behind it. And the, problem, the problems began long before this for David. It began when David had an affair. You're, you're going to probably be familiar with this story. It, he had an affair with a woman named Bathsheba. Bathsheba was the wife of a man named Uriah. Uriah was one of the commanders in David's army. And the story, you'll find it in 2 Samuel, uh, Samuel chapter 11. I'm not going to read you the whole story. I might read you a, full, a few snippets as we go. But basically what happens is this. David is staying at home in Jerusalem, and he's staying at home at a time when kings ought to be going out and leading their troops in battle, right? That's his job. He should be out there uh, leading his troops. He takes a break. He's resting at home. And in the middle of that time, as his troops are out fighting for him, one day he's out there on his rooftop or something, and he looks across the way, and he sees this woman named Bathsheba bathing, and he's attracted to her, and one thing leads to another. He ends up committing adultery with Bathsheba. And he thought he hid his sin pretty well, but this little complication comes in. She gets pregnant, right? Oh no, what's he going to do now? So he concocts this scheme. I'm in this far. I'm going to go a little deeper now. So he's like, well, I can get out of this. So he plans kind of a cover-up. And, and what he does is uh, he, he basically adds manipulation now to his, his first sin, lying and manipulation. What he does is he calls his commander Uriah home from the battlefield. And he says, oh, Uriah, you need a break. You know, you ought to come home, you know, stay home, be with your wife for a few days. What happens when soldiers come home from the war, spend a few days with their wives? He's like, for surely, you know, they'll be together and, and then everything will look fine. That doesn't happen. Uriah is a man of integrity. He's like, how can I go home and rest and enjoy the pleasures of home while my soldiers are off in the field? And so he sleeps on the, uh, you know, at the door of the, the uh, of the palace where David is staying, just waiting for, to be sent back out into the battle. So that plan doesn't work. <laughs> he can't cover up the pregnancy. And when that plan fails, David adds another sin to his already long growing list of sins. It's a sin of murder. He basically arranges for his commander Uriah to get sent out into the front lines of the battle in a place where he would surely get killed. Uriah does get killed. And David ends up taking Bathsheba as his own wife. Terrible story, right? <laughs> Put that in modern day, uh, modern day context, we would, we would probably have the worst judgment for a man like that. As the story continues on, when the prophet Nathan comes to David and confronts him for his multiple sins, David responds in brokenness and, and mourning and he repents, he confesses, he repents, and he finds grace, he finds forgiveness, he finds restoration. But like someone said in Sunday school this morning, for the rest of his life he continues to suffer the consequences for this little time period in his life. From the actions that he took in that episode. So I want you to listen from Second Samuel, listen to what Nathan tells David when he confronts him. He lists out some of the consequences that are, that are ahead. 
He says in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 9, Nathan says to David, Why have you despised God's word to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and have taken his wife to be your wife, and you have killed him with the sword of the Amorites. Now therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me, and you have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against you out of your own house, and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor, and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of, his, of this son. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son. Whew, heavy consequences, right? Boy, do those consequences come for David. As you continue to read on the story in 2 Samuel, Samuel you'll see that David's first child, the, the child that he conceived with Bathsheba, she dies, or, or his first child dies. Another son of his, Amnon, has an incident where he rapes his own half-sister, Tamar. David, failing to punish Amner, uh, he fails to punish his son Amnar for that incident. And so the other, another son, Absalom, who was Tamar's full brother, murders the first brother in revenge. David fails to punish Absalom for that incident. He, he kind of sends him off into exiles just so, you know, get him away from the situation. That just further complicates things. Later, he allows Absalom to return to Jerusalem, but David kind of refuses to associate with him at that time, just breeding this hatred and resentful resentfulness inside Absalom. Absalom sits outside the gate of the city and just starts stirring up trouble with the people. He's saying things like, oh, if I were only allowed to rule, things would be much better. I would be much, a much better ruler than my father David. And, and then one thing leads to another. Finally, Absalom it mounts an outright rebellion against David, gathers forces around him, and David is forced to flee the city in order to spare great bloodshed in the city. Absalom moves right in. He takes over the throne. And just as Nathan had foretold, he takes David's wives to be his own. And in a display, he, out on the rooftops, he sleeps with David's wives in view of everyone, just as Nathan had predicted. So David understands why all of these troubles had co have, have come. It was clearly laid out for him by the prophet Nathan. He knows why he's suffering these consequences. And here, back to Psalm 3 now, we're right in the middle of that whole story. David has left the city. Long ago, he's repented of his sin. He's restored his relationship with God. But the consequences of that sin are still plaguing him. So let's take a walk through this little short psalm and just see David's example on how to shift from fear and from failure into trust and into victory. I want to kind of look at it into, in four different sections, two verses in each section. First, in verses 1 and 2, it tells me in order to shift from this place of fear and failure, understanding why I'm in all this trouble, but still feeling like maybe I'm, I'm a complete failure. In order to shift from that into a, a, a trust in God and, and, and into a place of victory, it says I need to first pour out, just simply pour out my heart to God. In verse 1 and 2, see whether or not you feel of worthy of God's help. I know I, I, I find myself in that place a lot. I just don't feel like I can even reach out to God because I've, met, I've disappointed him, right? But even when I feel like that, I, the, the encouragement is pushed through that as David did here. Pour your heart out to him wherever you're at. Today, God, God welcomes you right where you're at. And so David wakes up in the morning. He's probably hiding out in a cave somewhere out in the wilderness on the run from his son who wants to kill him, who wants to take his throne. And his prayer starts out with this kind of unashamed, unfiltered bearing of his heart to the only one who, who can actually make a difference in his situation. So he says in verse 1 and 2, Oh Lord, how many are my foes? Many are rising against me. Many are saying of my soul, there is no salvation for him in God. It's this, it's this cry of desperation. He's being attacked on, on, on two fronts. First of all, he's surrounded by thousands of people who want to literally kill him. 
And he's also, he's facing this wave of opposition from people who, who were probably his friends, his supporters at one time until Absalom turned them against him. Because David was a very popular king. He was loved by his people. And now, as you read the story, you'll see that many of them wanted to kill him. Now he's in the middle of this mess. And not just that, but there are now there are people who are sowing these seeds of doubt in his own mind, saying things like in verse 2, there is no deliverance for you. You're not going to get out of this situation, David. You've created your own mess. In other words, he's already down, and now he's being kicked again when he's down. And this is described, I think, really well in, in 2 Samuel 16. Just a little snippet here. 2 Samuel 16, verses 5 through 8. The, the, this idea of what people coming around and just accusing him and kicking him when he's down. It, it says this, When King David came to bah Bahurim, there, were, there came out a man of the family of the house of Saul. So here... <laughs> Taken in context that whole story. So now this is a, a, a guy from Saul's house who's coming out. His name was Shimei, the son of Gera. And, and as this man came out, he started cursing David continually. And he threw stones at David and all the servants of King David and all the people and all the mighty men on his right hand and on his left. And this man said as he cursed, Get out, get out, you man of blood, you worthless man. The Lord has avenged on you all the blood of the house of Saul in whose place you have reigned. And the Lord has given the kingdom into the hand of your son Absalom. See, your evil is upon you, for you are a man of blood. <sighs> Being kicked when you're already down. Do you think all of this had a tendency to push David over the edge, down into despair? Here he is experiencing the results of this situation he created. And on top of that, people are telling him, God has given up on you. <laughs> I know he was in despair. I, I, I feel that despair. And more than just feeling it, listen to this. In, in, again, back to 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel 15. This, is, this tells me even more about how David felt. 2 Samuel 15, verse 30. It says, as David went up the ascent of the Mount of Olives, said he, went, he was weeping as he went barefooted with his head covered and all the people who were with him covered their heads and they all went out weeping as they went. So this is a picture of David being kicked out of the city of Jerusalem by his son Absalom and, and it's just this picture of despair. He's going up, he's weeping and all the people surrounding him are weeping too. He's about as low as he can go. I wonder, can you, has there ever been a time in your life when you can identify with those kinds of feelings? <laughs> I raised my hand. Yes, I've been there. Maybe not to the extent, the danger that David has been in, but I know what it feels like to have the world against me or to feel like the world's against me. And when I'm there, it's tempting to think that God is against me as well. But David reminds me that that's a lie. The opposite is actually true. For when I'm at my most broken, when I'm at my, in, in the, the deepest despair, that's when God is maybe closer to me than ever before. Don't blame God. Don't hide your heart from God. First thing, if you want to move from this place of fear and failure and despair and disappointment into this place of trust and peace and victory, you need to be honest with God and tell him what's on your heart. He can handle it. You'll begin to see this shift as you just get out what's inside. The second thing, the next step in our shift from fear to failure is found in verses 3 and 4, and it's simply to begin to remember the truth, to remember the true things about God. Verse 3, David says, after he's now poured out his heart to God, he has a little but in there. But you, O Lord, are, and he begins to speak truth, you, O Lord, are a shield about me. My glory and the lifter of my head. Verse 4, I cried aloud to the Lord and he answered me from his holy hill. You see, David could have given up at this point. I imagine myself in that position probably being very, very, very tempted to, to just give up, maybe fall on my own sword. And maybe we would even understand if David chose to respond that way. I, I wonder if David even remembered and identified 
a time when, when he was on the other side, when, when Saul was the one running out of the city, fleeing for his life, and David was the one pursuing him. And David, in the middle of the night, you know, crept in there with his armies, and he had the chance to kill Saul. Remember, he chose not to. And in the end, fall, Saul did fall on his own sword. He gave up. But instead of David giving up at this point, he renews his trust in God, and he begins to get a little theological at this point. He reminds himself about some truths of God. We talked about this in Sunday school, that when, when things like this happen in our lives, these self created messes or maybe messes that other people bring upon us, situations we've gone through, uh, some, somehow out of that we, we, we start to believe these lies about ourselves. Whether they're spoken things, that things, things people say to you directly, you know, you're terrible, you're worthless, like they were saying to David, you're a failure, God is against you now. Sometimes they're spoken outright like that. Sometimes the lies are just things I begin to hear in my own head. And so David responds to that by reminding himself about some truths. What truths does he talk about? First he says, God, you are my shield. I am way far ahead. Let's try to get back on track here. Nope. All right, we'll just leave that well and left alone. First, he reminds himself, God, you are my shield. He knew this about God, obviously. He knew, he knew his history. He knew his scriptures. He knew that God had told Abraham, I am your shield. I am your great reward. He was familiar with words, similar words that Moses had spoken. David, at this point, just needed a reminder because, you see, a shield was the most important defensive tool that they had in those times. Here David is calling on God as his protector, God as his helper. His enemies on the one hand are saying there is no deliverance for you from God in verse 2, right? And against that lie, David is speaking truth back into that lie. lie. He's saying, yes, yes, there is deliverance because I know this true thing about God. I know God is my shield. He is my deliverer. He, he, he is my shield, <laughs> And this is true for you. It's true for me. God is our shield. He's our protector. He's our helper. That's a true thing about God that never changes. And if you're being attacked by failure, by sickness, attacked by a lost job, by, by loneliness, maybe by a strained relationship, or by any number of these kinds of modern-day enemies, the truth is that God is your shield. He is the one that stops the arrows, those lies that come from the enemy. I want to make you believe what is not true. Second truth he reminds himself of is, is this, that God, you are my glory. What does he mean by that? Glory, the way it's used here, means honor, dignity, reputation, abundance. Do you think David needed to remember that at this time? He, he was king, sitting on the throne. Now he's on, on the run for his life. And as he's going, people are telling him, you deserve everything you get, David. David reminds himself here that his honor, his dignity, don't depend on his situation. It doesn't depend on what people are saying about him. His honor, his dignity, his glory comes from God. God is my reputation. God is my honor. If I find my honor, my approval, my accolades in, in things around me, in the world around me, or people around me, or even from within myself, I'm going to be let down every single time. And so he speaks this truth. God, you are my glory. That's where I find my honor. Third, he says, you are the lifter of my head. And I love this. <laughs> because when I hear that, the lifter of my head, the, the picture that I get in my mind is, is this sobbing child. I maybe picture one of my children who has done something wrong and, and, and I've, you know, I'm disciplining him, him for it. And he's this picture of this child who's, who's hanging his head in shame in front of me and, and he can't look up until, until the parent, until I maybe reach down and say, Josiah, look at me. Lifting up, you know, put my hand under his chin, lift his head up and say, look at me in the eyes. Yes, I'm disciplining, but I love you. I don't think any less of you. That sweet forgiveness and love. See, God... 
is reminding David, I, yes, I've, you have consequences. I've had to deal with you harshly in response to this sin, and yet I lift your head up. Look at me with the value that I've placed on you. You see, you and I don't have to mope around and, and try to look sad enough for somehow to, to earn God's sympathy. When God forgives us in his grace, he lifts our head. It says, my child, you can look into my eyes. I don't love you any less than I did yesterday. God is my shield. He's my glory. He's the lifter of my head. Those are three great names for God, three great truths about God, three truths that every one of us can use to speak against the lies that come against us. And so if you want to shift from fear and failure into trust and victory, begin to remember the truths and to speak those truths to your own heart. One, one other truth David adds on there is that God answers prayer, right? Verse 4, he says, I cried aloud to God. In, in other words, I prayed and he answered me from his holy hill. When he says that, it's in verse 4, poetically, he's kind of expressing his confidence that God would hear him when he prayed. God's holy hill or his holy mountain, it's, it's talking about Mount Moriah in Jerusalem. That's the place where God stopped Abraham from sacrificing Isaac. It's the place where, where David, he bought that place of land from, a, uh, from the landowner in order to, to, to build an altar to God. It's a place where Solomon in, in the future would build the temple. It's, a, this, 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 it's this place for the people of Israel that was this physical reminder of the presence of God and his answers to prayer, his intervening as he did for Abraham and Isaac. God hears and God answers. It's a powerful truth. The third step in our shift from fear and failure into trust and victory is this, simply to focus on God's answer, not on the trouble around you. Verse 5 and 6, David says, I lay down and I slept and I woke again for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of many thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. And so at this point, David, God doesn't just kind of pat David on the head and, and tell him it's going to be all right. He gives a real concrete answer that, that I believe resonated deep in David's heart, in his spirit. And it's found in, in these simple words, I slept and I awoke. How is that God's answer to prayer? I don't want you to miss the significance of those simple words. You see, if, if, think about it. In wartime, uh, Bob, you probably know this. In wartime, they tell soldiers, be careful, right? The, the slightest slip-up can get you in serious danger. I remember hearing stories of soldiers in Vietnam where they said that, you know, the Viet Cong would place, would throw like empty pop cans or pop bottles out in, in the paths because they knew that American soldiers couldn't resist like casually kicking things as they went by and they would attach those to, you know, explosives or bombs. I don't know if that story is true or not, but it's a great illustration of this. David knows right now that his enemies are ready to pounce. He knows he needs to be on his alert. It probably kept him awake at night. He knows that so, you know, again, he was in this situation with Saul, and Saul let his guard down. David was able to creep in there and could have killed him in the middle of the night. And so David says, he wakes up in the morning, he has this great realization, I slept all night long, and then I woke up. <laughs> what God did in answer to prayer, David realized in the morning, wow, I slept through the whole night, and I'm still alive, I'm still here. If somehow God filled me with enough peace in the middle of this terrible situation, enough peace to rest, to actually fall asleep. And not just that, but he protected me all night long, so I woke up now, I'm alive, ready for the next day. He protected me and sustained me. You see, for me, I usually want the answer from God that, that takes me out totally out of the situation or like removes the situation from me. Uh, often, though, his answer is to leave me in the middle of that situation because he has something there for me. And in, his answer is in the middle of that situation to sustain me. His assurance is this, I have sustained you yesterday, Tim. <laughs> I sustained you last night while you slept. I will sustain you again today. I will protect you. I will carry you through this day. Now go face that the, the day. I have given you 
everything you need. It says in the New Testament, he's not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of strength and love and power. I think this is David's Ebenezer. <laughs> if you're familiar with the old hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, the second, in the second verse of that hymn, one of the lines says, Here I'll raise my Ebenezer, hither by, thy, hither by thy help I've come, and I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. And I love that word Ebenezer. It refers back to another story in 1 Samuel when after this great battle, Samuel lays down this memorial stone, kind of builds an altar that he calls a stone of remembrance. And he names that stone, his, he names that stone Ebenezer. Ebenezer means thus far the Lord has helped us. Job had a similar situation in the middle of his life when in the, one of the darkest moments, he has this great moment where he has this incredible revelation about the truth of God and, and it's so great, it's so overwhelming for him in the middle of his darkness that, that he tells someone, you know, go get me a pen and ink that, so I can write this down. And then he's like, no, 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 no that's not good enough. Go, go get me like, uh, you know, lead and, and a hammer so I can chisel this onto a stone because I need to remember this. And what does he remember? He, he says, you'll, you'll find it in Job 19, 23 through 26, he says, I know my Redeemer lives. He, it's, it's Job's kind of Ebenezer, his stone of reverence. God has helped me. I know my Redeemer lives, and I know he will carry me on into the future. So this, these words, I believe, are David's Ebenezer. I slept and I awoke. Remember, this is a psalm of morning, uh, this morning prayer of trust in God. So he's waking up, he's getting ready for a new day of battle, a new day of danger. And he's looking at this little stone of rem remembrance saying, I slept, I awoke, I'm still here. Okay, God, let's go into battle together today. Listen again to his confidence in verse 6. He says, I will not be, this is, this is me picturing David going out to face his new battles for the day. I will not be afraid of many thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. Remember, lay down your stone of remembrance and remember these true things about God. Final step in our shift from fear and failure into trust and victory is this. Begin to praise God for his deliverance before it even happens. I think that's what David does at the end of the psalm. Verse 7 and 8. He just bursts out in praise. He says, okay, arise, O God. Save me, O my God. For, and then he says some things. He, in a sense, he's saying, this is what's going to happen. You strike all my enemies on the cheek. You break the teeth of the wicked. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing be on your people. It's pretty ugly language, but David is pointing to God as his deliverer. And notice he even, he even says it in the past tense. He says, salvation or deliverance belongs to God and it is already accomplished, even if it doesn't look like that right now. David doesn't let his enemies' accusations push him down. He uses them to stir himself up to take hold of God. What a change from, from the beginning of the psalm. In, in other words, in, as a matter of fact, compare his his attitude here at the end of this psalm, again, to what he sounds like in, in 2 Samuel chapter 15. 2 Samuel 15, verse 25. This is David speaking, and again, they're, they've left the city, and David says this in 1525. Then the king said to Zadok, one of his men, says, carry the ark of God back into the city. If I find favor in the eyes of the Lord, he will bring me back and let me see both it and his dwelling place. But if he says, I have no pleasure in you, behold, here I am. Let him do to me what seems good to him. <laughs> right? Kind of read it like that because I hear David just giving up at that point. Like, yeah, go ahead and bring the ark back in. Maybe God will let me come back someday and see it. But if not, whatever God pleases, that's fine. Compare that to the end of this psalm where he says, You have delivered me. You will deliver me. Salvation belongs to you. <laughs> Blessing be on your people. 
He ends it with this double declaration. God's the only one with the powerful power for deliverance, but not only does he have the, have the power, he also has, has my best intentions in mind. It says, your blessing upon your people. And that's not a request. <laughs> like some of the Bible translations out there make it sound like it's this request because they add the word may in there. If that's in your version, just cross it out because that's not in the original text. The right translation here is your blessing be on your people. <laughs> your blessing on your people. It is on your people. It's a statement of fact. Your people, God, are blessed whether or not they realize it or recognize it, whether or not they're in trouble. Your people are blessed. So I want to ask you as kind of wrap it up. Are you in a big mess today? <laughs> Have you been in a big mess? Are you, do you foresee that down the road? Are you facing an enemy of overwhelming odds? You need to realize something, and this isn't original with me. It's something I need to remind myself of. You can't put scrambled eggs back under the chicken. <laughs> I heard someone say that. In other words, when you've made a mess of things, or when things have been made a mess for you, you can't put all the pieces back together perfectly like they were before. You can't rewind your life back to where the trouble started. But there are some things you can do. What can you do? Again, simply, first of all, you can, you can get up. This is a morning prayer of trust in Psalm 3. And I think the encouragement is, is simply get up, wake up, and get out of bed and do what David did in the morning when he prayed this prayer of trust. Get up and pour your heart out to God, unfiltered, unedited. It might be angry. It might be dismal. It might, I don't know what your emotion is at the time, but let God know what's in your heart. <laughs> get up and then speak the true things about God. We, lit, we made a list in Sunday school, a tiny little list, but things that are true about God and things that are true about what God says about me. I am his beloved child. Things like that. Speak those true things about God to your own heart. Get up and, and focus on God's answer, not on the trouble around you. It's a shift in where you're looking. Know that God, a true thing about God is that he does answer and he promises to answer. It may not always look like I want it to look, but he does do it. So shift my eyes from the situation around me to the one who holds the answers. Get up and praise God for his deliverance before it even happens because there's a power in praise. There's a reason when they went out to battle, they sent the praise team out ahead of the army singing because they knew the power of praise to destroy the strength of the enemy. Secondly, what can you do? I encourage you to lay down your Ebenezer, lay down your stone of remembrance. And I believe that you have had an experience that you can call your Ebenezer, your stone of remembrance, the reminder that God is your helper. That time when maybe God spoke in your heart with this deep reassurance, that time when he visited you with his truth, that time maybe he showed up and you were uncertain about what to do next and he just he gave you this crystal clear guidance, right? He does that sometimes. Maybe that time when God delivered your sick child, that's an Ebenezer, right? <laughs> you're worried, maybe you're, someone near to you was even close to dying and you saw God deliver them. That time maybe God provided for your financial needs in some unexpected way or some other way that you've experienced God's intervention for you. That, that, that's what I mean when I say remember your Ebenezer, your stone of remembrance. Because there's a power in remembering those things and, and in a sense laying down a stone, a memorial stone to remember that. I have some literal physical stones in my room that have some words on them reminding me of certain things because there are times when I forget the truths about God and I need to remember. I know what my Ebenezer's are. God has shown himself faithful to my family in so many ways. I remember how he intervened for one of my children in, when she was three years old in this frightening thing that was way out of our control. I remember how he did speak very deeply and clearly 
to my heart with some specific scripture and some very near to audible voices that that spoke directly into a situation I was going through a few years back and he showed me hope and healing coming out of that. So what are your Ebenezers? What are those things that you can point to to say, I know my Redeemer lives. I know my God cares about you. You need to find those things and mark them. Get up and then lay down your Ebenezer. So I want to close with just this little exercise. We did something a little similar in Sunday school, but I want you to just close your eyes for a minute. And in the beginning, I talked about your thing, whatever. If you've come in here this morning with something that's in front of you that seems a little overwhelming, I want you to picture that thing. And I want you to give that thing a name. Oh, you know, one word, two words. What is it? What is it that you're facing in your life right now? Give it a name. And then as you picture that, as you name that thing, look into your heart. What are the feelings that come up around that? Is it fear? Is it shame? Maybe it's something you've done that causes you shame. Is it sadness? What are the feelings? When you, get a, when you get a sense of some of those feelings and, and what that situation is, let me ask you this question. What, what lies have you come to believe because of this thing you're facing? Maybe it's lies that other people have spoken directly to you. You're not worthy. God doesn't love you. He's not there for you. Maybe it's lies that you are speaking to yourself or or just that your own heart is feeling. When you get a sense of those feelings and some of those lies that come out of it, I want you to hear this out of this psalm. I want you to hear one more time the truth. The truth is this. God is your shield. God is the lifter of your head. God answers you from his holy hill. God is your glory, your honor. God is your worth. You woke up this morning because God sustained you last night. God is your first father with faithful and unconditional love. You are a blessed person. These things are truth. And now, Father, I pray through your spirit that you would do again what I cannot do. I, every one of us, I believe, go through times in our lives where we tend to either listen to the eyes of the, the lies of the enemy because he is the father of lies or we listen to the own, our own lies resulting from our broken experiences, resulting from our, the way we, the feelings we go through as a result of those experiences. But you are truth. Your word is truth and you never change. And so I pray through your spirit that you would take these kinds of truths and more and that you would drive them down into my heart. That you would drive them down into the heart of each person here. And I just pray that you would do that work through your spirit. I pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Lord, thank you for this time to be together as brothers and sisters, to encourage each other. I ask that you'd watch over us, help us remember who's going to win this battle, and be with those we love, our children and those who are far away, and watch over them as well. 
Thank you, Lord, for your grace and your redemption. Amen.